So what are we to make of the Industrial Revolution? The event that allowed us today to have a greater standard of living, arguably, than kings and queens in the Middle Ages could ever have dreamed of, but that also caused pollution and climate change and uh, class divisions and just misery for the working class that actually made it happen. Today, we're going to be judging that event. What was gained and at what cost? In judging this event, we have to consider some pretty complex questions. For example, do you enjoy modern medicine? Do you like it that anesthesia exists? So if a surgeon has to cut you open, you won't feel it. Do you enjoy being born and surviving? That's something that came from the Industrial Revolution. Um, do you enjoy public education? Think before you answer. I know at this moment, maybe you don't if you're in class, but the right to a free education is arguably the fastest ladder up the social hierarchy in the world that we live in today. And that's a right that most people today take for granted and even complain about, but that absolutely did not exist for most people before the Industrial Revolution. Do you like having access to goods from around the world that you can afford? Do you like owning more than one shirt? What about having all of the knowledge of the world in your pocket? I know that smartphones now are like mostly used for TikToks and you know, looking up stupid memes, but you have access to the sum total of what is known through the internet and you can carry it around with you and you can consult it whenever. That's revolutionary, that's huge. Do you like it? Um, what about the ability to travel safely to almost anywhere in the world within your lifetime, often? Or having heat and air conditioning when it works? All of these benefits that enrich our lives that often we take for granted are in one way or another effects of the Industrial Revolution. So we have to keep that in mind when we're judging this event, especially when the event itself came with like some pretty horrifying human costs that can keep our attention. On the other hand, how many people currently suffer and have historically had to suffer for all of these things to be possible? Which we all still exploit for what it's worth. Have you ever thrown out an old iPhone to get a new one? Is your shirt made in a sweatshop? There's a lot of hidden exploitation in a lot of the things that we own. Um, remind me to tell you about where the metals that make our smartphones work come from. It's not a pretty story. So the exploitation of some people, the just absolute misery of some people's lives is the cost of a greater standard of living for most. Is that something that we're comfortable accepting? Also, social inequality persists and it's getting worse. And what I think is even worse is that our society seems to have completely normalized it. Not only is social inequality something that's accepted, but it's so normal that often I hear, you know, some of my least privileged students making the arguments that keep them down. Um, you've probably heard arguments about how, you know, we should keep the tax rates low because that creates jobs or um, somewhere like people suspect that if you're poor in America, somehow you've done something to deserve it. Maybe you didn't try hard enough or whatever. All of these ideas normalized just a staggering inequality where we have like a handful of billionaires that could end poverty and hunger in our country and every day they make a choice not to and we argue to keep the system in place. That's also a result of the Industrial Revolution and the capitalist system that it put into place. So, complicated um, problem of evaluating this, and we're going to take a crack at it today. As we take a crack at it, try to keep in mind not just the positives and negatives of industrialization, but also how they affect different social classes, because each different social class absolutely did not and does not experience the event in the same way. Also, think about how different this can, calculation can be over time. Um, the working class now is different from the working class back then, for example. So, something to keep in mind. As we go through this lesson, I would like you to give it a shot to take notes through the presentation and then check them against the key points at the end and add anything you may have missed.
since we're evaluating um, pros and cons of an event, my suggestion is to make a T chart in your notes with positive effects on one side and negative effects on the other so that you can look at your list at the very end and come to your own conclusion. Um, here's an example of what those lists might look like. If you feel like you need a preview of what to listen for, it might be a good idea to pause the slide here and have a look, maybe take some preliminary notes and then add details through the presentation. If you want to try your hand at like a higher level lesson, try doing this on your own and I will show this slide again at the very end so you can kind of check how much you got. We're going to start off with the mostly good stuff. And mostly the good stuff has to do with material conditions of life improving significantly. That means like quality of life, our standard of living, our access to stuff and our ability to use it, for example. And we're going to start with one of the harder sources that I assigned, but a really good one. It's fascinating. It's from a book called A Farewell to Alms, A Brief Economic History of the World, published in 2007 by historian Gregory Clark. Gregory Clark, excuse me. Um, this source is complicated, so I'm going to read you the text and then I'm also going to summarize it on the side, on the same slide for you. A couple of things to keep in mind in advance. First, before 1800 really means before the Industrial Revolution. After 1800 refers to after the Industrial Revolution. Now that doesn't mean the Industrial Revolution all happened in that one year. It absolutely did not. But that's basically the divide that he's going to make in, um, in his argument. Second, material consumption is a phrase that just refers to the amount of stuff that people consume. Our standard of living is something is a way to think about it. The masses, you're going to see this a lot. The masses refer to the vast numbers of regular folks that tend not to have power in history, lower class people. And an epoch is a long period of time. As we go through the source, try to identify as many positive and negative effects of the Industrial Revolution as possible. And at the end, argue, does the positive outweigh the negative? Try to summarize this argument in a thesis statement at the very end. So your opinion plus two specific reasons. The big overview of the source has to do with the change of industrialization. For thousands of years, most people on Earth lived in abject poverty, like total poverty, first as hunter-gatherers, then as peasants or laborers. But with the Industrial Revolution, some societies traded this ancient poverty for amazing wealth, comparatively. In the Industrial Revolution, the English population at last became productive enough to escape from poverty, followed quickly by other countries with the same long agrarian or farming past. So the question is, what difference did the Industrial Revolution made? And that's a question he'll be answering in the source. Professor Clark writes, the basic outline of world economic history is surprisingly simple. Indeed, it can be summarized in one diagram shown on the slide. Before 1800, before the Industrial Revolution, income per person, the food, clothing, heat, light, and housing available per head varied across societies and epochs. But there was no upward trend. Short-term gains in income through technological advances were inevitably lost through population growth. Thus, the average person in the world of 1800 was no better off than the average person of 100,000 BCE. Indeed, in 1800, the bulk of the world's population was poorer than their remote ancestors. The lucky denizens or citizens of wealthy societies, such as 18th century England, managed a material lifestyle equivalent to that of the Stone Age. But the vast swath of humanity in East and South Asia, particularly in China and Japan, eked out a living under conditions probably significantly poorer than those of cavemen. In other words, before the Industrial Revolution, income per person stayed mostly the same. And you can see that here where my mouse is on the graph through history. The average person, says Professor Clark, was no better off just before the Industrial Revolution 
than the average person of 10,000 BCE, around the time of the Neolithic Revolution. Actually, he says, most of the population was poorer. The rich had more stuff than the poor, but for most people worldwide, they had a lower standard of living than cavemen. Professor Clark hints at this Malthusian trap concept, which I'll explain because students year after year tend to find it interesting. For thousands of years, most people lived in poverty here. The Industrial Revolution was the key event that got us out of it because it was the first time that people were able to be productive enough to escape from poverty. And what that really means is that for all of this time, the economy was locked in what is called a Malthusian trap. Each time new technology increased the efficiency of production a little bit, the population grew. So the extra mouths ate up the surplus and average income fell back to its former level. So like every advance was followed by population growth that kind of killed the, the point of that advance. The tendency of population to grow faster than the food supply, keeping most people at the edge of starvation, was described by Thomas Malthus in a 1798 book, and it's referred to as the Malthusian trap. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution here that humanity was able to get out of that, to be productive enough that productivity exceeded population growth. As Dr. Clark's data shows, um, this kind of trap governed the English economy from 1200 until the Industrial Revolution and probably humankind throughout existence. The only break people got was during disasters like the Black Death, ironically, which is when the population tanked and for several generations the survivors had more to eat. The Industrial Revolution was the first escape from this trap and it occurred when efficiency of production at last accelerated growing fast enough to outpace population growth and allow average incomes to rise. So anyway, long story short, before the Industrial Revolution, standard of living was not great. It was probably worse than before the Neolithic Revolution. Professor Clark continues, the quality of life also failed to improve on any other observable dimension. Life expectancy was no higher in 1800 than for hunter-gatherers. 30 to 35 years. Stature, height, a measure of both the quality of diet and of children's exposure to disease, was higher in the Stone Age than in 1800. And while foragers satisfy their material wants with small amounts of work, so they get what they need with a little bit of work, the modest comforts of the English in 1800 were purchased only through a life of unrelenting drudgery. Nor did the variety of material consumption improve. The average forager had a diet, a work life, much more varied than the typical English worker of 1800. Even though the English table by then included such exotics as tea, pepper, and sugar. And hunter-gatherer societies are egalitarian. That means they treat each other equally. Material consumption varies little across the members. In contrast, inequality was pervasive or everywhere in the agrarian or farming economies that dominated the world in 1800. The riches of a few dwarfed the pinched allocations of the masses. In other words, life expectancy had not gone up meaningfully over time, and hunter-gatherers worked less than the average English dude in 1800 did before the Industrial Revolution. Even though rich people had access to more kinds of food, their diet was worse than hunter-gatherers. Plus, hunter-gatherers treated each other equally, while inequality grew out of control by 1800. Jane Austen may have written about refined conversations over tea served in china cups. She was an author that wrote a bunch of books about this time period, about the upper class mostly. But for the majority of the English as late as 1813, Conditions were no better for their naked ancestors of the African savanna. The Darcys, the main characters of Jane Austen novels, were few. The poor were plentiful. So in other words, by 1800, there was a small number of rich people and a ton of poor people. So even according to the broadest measures of material life, 
Average welfare, if anything, declined from the Stone Age to 1800. The poor of 1800, those who lived by their unskilled labor alone, would have been better off if they had been transferred into a hunter-gatherer band. So in other words, in terms of stuff, standard of living, well-being, etc., people were worse off by 1800 than they had been as cavemen. Here's the big change. The Industrial Revolution, a mere 200 years ago, changed forever the possibilities for material consumption. Incomes per person began to undergo sustained growth in a favored group of countries. The richest modern economies are now 10 to 20 times wealthier than the 1800 average. Moreover, the biggest beneficiary of the Industrial Revolution has so far been the unskilled, there have been benefits aplenty for the typical wealthy owners of land or capital and for the educated, but industrialized economies saved their best gifts for their poorest. So in other words, here's the big change. The Industrial Revolution is what changed the situation he described so far. Income per person went up, states got richer, and now the unskilled got the best parts of this change, which is a really big claim. He doesn't say this, but probably he has in mind a generally improved standard of living, access to more stuff, access to better medicine as his reasoning. Prosperity, however, has not come to all societies. Material consumption in some countries, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, is now well below the pre-industrial norm. Countries such as Malawi or Tanzania would have been better off in material terms had they never had contact with the industrialized world and instead continued in their pre-industrial state. Modern medicine, airplanes, gasoline, computers, the whole technological cornucopia of the past 200 years have succeeded there in producing among the lowest material living standards ever experienced. These African societies have remained trapped in the Malthusian era, where technological advances merely produce more people and living standards are driven down to subsistence. But modern medicine has reduced the material minimum required for subsistence to a level far below that of the Stone Age. Subsistence is barely surviving. So what he's saying is the good things about industrialization are not shared evenly throughout all societies. For example, things in Africa got worse after the Industrial Revolution. Weirdly, the things that seem good about the Industrial Revolution, like medicine and communication and technology, actually lowered the standards of living there because these things in Africa allowed more people to survive. So the population goes up, but without extra stuff to go around because that region itself didn't industrialize, the standard of living actually goes down lower. Just as the Industrial Revolution reduced income inequalities within societies, it has increased them between societies in a process recently labeled the Great Divergence. The gap in incomes between countries is of the order of 50 to 1. There walk the earth now both the richest people who have ever lived and the poorest. So in other words, the Industrial Revolution made income inequalities within societies go down. So the rich and the poor were less far apart, but it made inequality between different states go up. Industrialized countries do better. Non-industrialized areas like Sub-Saharan Africa got worse. Now let's look at a second source on the benefits of the Industrial Revolution from Professor Eugene Weber, one of my favorites, um, from his lecture series called The Western Tradition. Professor Weber writes, in 1800, before the Industrial Revolution, three-fourths of the population of Europe were engaged in growing food. More than three-fourths of the food of ordinary people consisted of potatoes and bread. By 1900, after the Industrial Revolution, only half the population of Europe was growing food and Europeans were eating more vegetables, more meat, more fruit than ever before. But it was a long haul. Through all of recorded history until just the other day, Europe had lived on the verge of famine, 
or at least on the verge of hunger, as many people still do in non-industrialized nations. You can't control the weather. You can't control the harvest until the 19th century. Until that time, food shortages were par for the course. Famine was part of the experience of every generation in Europe. And famine didn't mean missing a meal. It meant people eating grass or earth or tree bark or sometimes their own hands or falling dead in the streets or in country villages. By 1914, after the Industrial Revolution, 2.5 times as many people lived in Europe as the century before, and they were better fed by a vastly smaller proportion of the population. It was a time of marvels. He's talking about the Industrial Revolution era. Powerful railroads, mighty bridges, giant factories, telegraphs, telephones, and newspapers for a penny that linked and shrank the world, and towering above them were the cities, symbols of an age. There were only about 16,000 miles of railroad track in Europe when Marx published his Communist Manifesto, but if you put them together with tunnels, railway bridges, the stations and workshops, and sheds that were part of the system, they already represented more stone and metal than all the monuments of antiquity, including the pyramids. When 19th century opened, Napoleon's armies, the French Revolutionary era um, emperor, Napoleon's armies didn't move much faster than those of Julius Caesar from ancient Rome. When the century closed, you could cross all of Europe in three or four days by rail. For the first time, news was consistently moving faster than people. In ancient times, you could send a message by carrier pigeon, and you could hope that the pigeon didn't get diverted along the way or eaten. In the time of the Three Musketeers, so during the Age of Absolute Monarchs, you could send a message by courier who might cover as much as 60 miles a day, as long as he wasn't held up by bad weather or by robbers. By the time of the French Revolution, you could send a message by semaphore telegraph, provided the message was simple and the weather was clear. But by the 1870s, after the Industrial Revolution, a telegram could reach around the world in a few hours, and by 1900, radio messages could move over oceans in a flash. So hopefully, throughout these sources you've gathered, concrete examples of positive effects of the Industrial Revolution. Check your list against those listed in the key points here, and if you've missed any, add them to your list. The material conditions of people's lives in the industrialized world changed dramatically. First, relating to goods. The factory system produced goods at significantly higher quantities and at lower costs than hand production could. And so working class people could afford to buy things that would have been considered luxuries before. In terms of movement, advances in communication, transport and technology led to improved agricultural production, the development of medicine, the circulation of information, people, and goods to parts of the world that had been isolated before. Railroads, telegraphs, steamboats, telephones, and electricity are all developments of the industrial age that helped make this happen. And in terms of information, news could travel fast now and the newspaper industry became powerful and influential, bringing information to the masses for the first time in history, thus shaping the masses, the huge numbers of lower class, generally powerless people into a political force. A well-informed public is much more likely to follow and care about politics than a public that doesn't know what's going on. And so this development is gonna have bigger developments as we move forward in history specifically because the masses of lower class people start to be a much bigger factor in shaping history, particularly as they concentrate in cities. Hopefully you didn't write those all out as sentences. Hopefully you added bullet points to your list of positive effects. And if you'd like an example of how to do that concisely, you can look at my list. Um, positive effects of industrialization are listed on the left. So go ahead and pause here Make sure your notes are up to date and then press play again. Now that your notes are up to date, let's think about what we've learned so far. In the Industrial Revolution, 
do the positive effects outweigh the negative? Was it worth it based on what you've heard so far based on these sources? Try to include one of the reasons that you give here from one of the sources that we covered. Second thesis statement, respond to this. Relative to the other revolutions we've looked at, ah, oh, there's a typo on my slide, no. How revolutionary was the Industrial Revolution? How much did this change compared to the Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment, or the American and French Revolutions? Pause here, respond to those two prompts in a thesis statement, and then press play again so that we can cover the not so good effects of the Industrial Revolution in more depth. So the Industrial Revolution had a huge effect on our material lives, but there are a lot of not so good aspects of it. And those largely relate to the human and environmental costs of this revolution. As we go through this part of the lesson, keep in mind problems that the working class faces that could potentially grow into political problems down the line. Some questions to get us thinking. One, the big question for the unit, is the benefit to society greater than the cost to individuals who lived through the Industrial Revolution or are living through it today? What are or were the benefits of industrialization and capitalism? What were the costs? And is the cheap stuff worth it? How do you fix the costs without letting go of the benefits? What costs are we ready to pay in order to keep the benefits? This is a moral question. This isn't a remember of fact you just learned questions. Like really think hard about your own moral compass in answering these. Are the costs worth it? Is a better standard of living for most worth a much lower standard of living for some? More broadly, why are we now, currently in the United States, culturally anti-poor. Where do we get these ideas? Reflexively, people tend to take the side of the capitalists, whether they know it or not. Different categories of other poor people are held responsible for low wages, for example, not the people who decide what wages to pay. Why is that? I'm sure that if you've paid attention to the news at all, you've heard some version of the economy is bad because immigrants are taking our jobs or something like that. Why do we blame other poor people for poverty and not the people who are growing rich by exploiting their labor? And if you could go back in time to undo the Industrial Revolution, knowing all that we've gained, but also the costs, would you do it? On the slide too, just it's worth pointing out the world's eight richest people in the world have the same wealth as the poorest half of the people in the world. Is that a level of inequality that we're comfortable living with? How are we judging this? Are we judging this by the present, the past, or the future? Etc. <laughs> All right, so let's start looking at the costs. First, let's remember the system that powered the Industrial Revolution, capitalism. Laissez-faire capitalism was a completely free, completely unregulated market at the time operated without rules or laws or restrictions on how businesses could operate. Businesses were driven as they are now by the profit motive, by the desire to make as much money as possible. And although Adam Smith was sure that this would lead to greater outcomes for everybody, the reality is that when there is a surplus of workers, when there are too many people who need jobs, and when the system relies on unskilled labor, making each worker easily replaceable, this system can cause some serious problems. Let's look at them. Child labor was one. Children were preferred in factories because you could pay them less, and they had little tiny fingers, which were really useful for cleaning out machine parts and the work didn't require any actual skills. Parents sent their children to work because they needed the money 
and school was not yet required. It would have been a luxury to think that you could send a child to school instead of sending them to work. Children worked in factories and they worked in coal mines. They were used in mines because they were small and so they could spend hours stooped over in tunnels, but they were doing this during their formative years when they were growing up. So that resulted in stunted growth. Conditions were dangerous. Um, there were explosions, floods, poison gas, falling down shafts, deformities, black lung, all kinds of things. And children worked incredibly long working days, starting around five in the morning, according to the testimony of one William Cooper, a textile worker, um, working the full day with only a 40 minute break for lunch for the entire day until 9 p.m. So often they'd get whipped or beaten in the afternoons to keep them awake when they'd get drowsy or if they weren't working hard enough. Um, that's a 16 hour shift for what it's worth. So when you complain about receiving an education and the effort that that requires, think long and hard about what you're complaining about. Okay, next problem. The living conditions were awful. Urbanization happened fast. It meant an explosion of people moving to cities for jobs and factories, and that was faster than anybody could plan for their uh, habitations. To accommodate all of these people, cities were built fast with slum housing, tenements is what they were called. Um, one family, sometimes more, would share a room with no running water, no toilet, etc. As you can imagine, take a good hard look at the picture on the top right of the slide. Disease would spread often and quickly in these kinds of conditions. And there was no such thing as like a sick day or health insurance or unemployment insurance. So being sick for too long could be like a, a fatal thing. Next problem, we're still living with this one, um, environmental and health issues. Pollution generally is what we're talking about. The industrial revolution caused massive pollution because it was powered with coal. That pollution has contributed to climate change and we're living with the consequences of like that perhaps irreversible problem. London was England's biggest city. It was built on the river and the river quickly became too polluted to drink or bathe or wash. Raw sewage would spread disease like cholera in it. It was gross, it would smell. Similarly, smoke and soot from factories would cover everything. There was no green space, the air quality was terrible, and that is not only depressing, but it causes some health problems. Inside the factories, there was no ventilation, it was hot, there were dust pack particles in the air, and people would often come down with what was called factory fever, if not worse. And we can add to that a ton of new social problems. Everyone in the family worked, so there was a decline in the importance of family life. Um, that means women, children, men. When women worked all day, they still had to come home and do all of the like feminine duties like cooking and cleaning and all that stuff because, you know, the patriarchy man. Um, next, people did the same job all day long, so they weren't gaining any skills and there certainly isn't any satisfaction in doing the same repetitive gesture day in, day out. Since everybody worked, conditions were super tough for anybody who was injured or sick or too old to work. Not only was there not enough like surplus money to take care of them, but there was nobody really available to do that. And there was a growing education gap. Working class kids worked, while upper class and increasingly middle class kids received an education. And whether you like it or not, children, education is power. So those are the immediate effects on the specific societies that industrialized, but then industrialized states because of capitalism started to have effects more globally. Imperialism, for example, it's often called the highest stage of capitalism for a reason. Imperialism describes European industrialized states going around the world and growing their empires so that they could colonize places or dominate them at the very least, take raw materials from them cheap so that they could bring them back to make finished goods in factories, and then turn around and sell those finished goods to those same colonies for a profit. Because capitalism works on the profit motive, the drive to get these raw materials to make finished products with at the cheapest possible cost inevitably led to imperialism. 
taking over other countries and taking their stuff. This was problematic, not just because there are moral issues with taking other people's stuff by force, but also because conquering all of these places um, required mass producing weapons, which led to militarism, which is a whole other issue. So not only was it raw materials extracted from the new imperialized parts of the world, but those parts of the world became markets to sell those finished goods too. So imperialized states kind of got the double benefit of that inhumane exploitation. We also have the problems of class and how to control the increasingly obvious separation between the very rich and the very poor, the masses of very poor people who are increasingly concentrated in cities. Because the masses of workers became concentrated in cities, like I just said a second ago, um, there was some power in numbers that they could kind of latch onto at the right moments. They started to be able to join together to pursue common interests, starting with labor unions, which we're going to look at in the next class. This growing mass of workers, whether they knew it or not, had some power over the powers that be politics, right? Just because it was an implicit threat. If you have a huge number of desperate people around and they all get angry about the same thing at the same time, and increasingly their access to news and political awareness could make that happen, that could be really dangerous for the people at the very top. So you need to do something to control that. This leads to the rise of propaganda, which is information, especially of a biased or misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. Just like advertisements try to get you to buy something by using pictures to manipulate opinions, governments started to find it necessary to shape the opinions of the masses. And for this, pictures were really effective in reaching the working class, most of whom couldn't read. There is propaganda about lots of stuff. At the left of the screen, you'll see that increasingly, as women started to push for the right to vote, which they wouldn't get until after a World War or two, there was equal proportions of propaganda about the evils of women ever voting. It's called women's suffrage. This also started to affect, in terms of militarism, um, once we get to World War I, we'll see how this worked. In a related note, propaganda was used to foster nationalism. Nationalism is an ideology about the superiority of one's national group over others. And it's really useful if you pay attention to the news, you'll see it at work today too, in controlling the working class. The working class had every reason to be angry, especially at those in power and the rich in their own states. So it's very useful for people in power to turn the anger of the working class against a visible target. Um, often you'll see this like kind of aimed at other minorities or other states. So propaganda was used to foster nationalism to identify min minority groups that the working class could focus its frustration on, which is good for the stability of the state and the capitalist system and not good at all for the minority groups. And that combined with imperialism led to the rise of a host of divisive and harmful ideologies, not just nationalism, but also social Darwinism, which began to emerge partly to rally the working class behind a common enemy other than the rich. Social Darwinism is a term scholars use to describe the practice of misapplying the evolutionary language of Charles Darwin to politics, the economy and society. Many social Darwinists embraced laissez-faire capitalism and racism, believing that the government should not intervene in the survival of the fittest by helping the poor, and promoted the idea that some races are biologically superior to others. So this justified not only imperialism, conquering other places and taking their stuff because they weren't, you know, as evolved, so went this theory, but also it justified the treatment of the poor because it must have been their own fault because they weren't the fittest after all.
So to summarize, mass politics, by which is meant this new situation where you have masses of people suddenly aware of politics and potentially involved in with opinions about politics that may need to be controlled, plus urbanization, lots of people moving into cities, means you suddenly have a whole lot of working class people concentrated in cities. Poor people don't threaten power as much when they're spread out in the countryside. In the cities, though, if they all get angry at the same thing at the same time and organize, well, we saw what happened with the French Revolution. So suddenly, people in power have to try to keep this new social group at least peaceably happy. This leads to lots of things that we still live with today, like propaganda to shape their opinions, nationalism to keep them in support of the state, scapegoating minority groups in times of economic or political crisis, the beginnings of a teeny tiny welfare state in which the state makes some provisions for the poor, and some back and forth on education. Some people want everyone to be educated so that cities are not overrun with dummies. Others don't because educating the masses gives them some power. The first free mandatory public schools started to take off around this time, but in most places they were only free and mandatory through elementary school, if at all. So, those are the major effects on power dynamics between these new social classes. In our next lesson, we'll be learning about how this leads to labor unions and socialism and then eventually communism. But then to cap off this effect that's like broader and more global and that we're also still living with today is this idea that the great powers have to compete to have the biggest colonies with the biggest armies to fuel industrial economies. And they get very used to using their militaries as like the first way to solve their problems. It's called militarism which is pretty dangerous, and it's gonna lead us directly to two world wars, which we study in the next unit. So please take a moment and summarize these negative effects in your T-chart about the Industrial Revolution in your notes. Industrialization and urbanization created a variety of social problems, many of which still persist today. It created a new class of wealthy businessmen and a growing middle class, but it also resulted in dangerous, unhealthy working conditions for workers and a growing divide between rich and poor. Capitalism and the factory system made working and living conditions for the industrial working class horrific. Coal polluted the cities. The rapid influx or moving in of people into urban centers led to really high population density and overcrowding. Add in pollution from the factories and you get overcrowded, unsanitary living conditions in cities. Add that at this time, capitalism worked completely free of restrictions or regulations. So there was no minimum wage, no safety standards for dangerous machinery, no laws against child labor or anything like that. Next problem was the factory system disrupting traditional family life. The need for wages in the growing cash economy meant that families became dependent on wages of women and children and then had to deal with longer working hours for the entire family, like 16 hour days. Factor in no minimum wage, no safety standards for dangerous machines, child labor, and working class kids not receiving educations. So you end up with workers learning no real skills with no real way to improve their lives. These conditions shattered traditional family norms and led to an increase in crime and work related diseases and injuries. Next set of problems has to do with social class. Society became even more divided during the Industrial Revolution as it concentrated wealth in the hands of the few, rich, drastically in increasing inequality. Because of all of these classes living together in the same cities, in industrial areas of Europe, socioeconomic changes created divisions of labor that led to the development of self-conscious classes, such as the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. As the factory system chewed up many poor workers, largely women and children, capitalists, upper-class investors and business owners, the bourgeoisie, in other words, benefited from an immense material boon that allowed them to live lives of leisure. Meanwhile, the middle class grew and began to demand a larger voice in politics, and the working class, the proletariat, was left with the scraps. If you are keeping up with your T-chart, you might have written down some of these factors. This is a great way of summarizing 
all of the positive and negative effects of industrialization that were in the key points. So if you want to pause and copy these down in your notes, that might be a good idea. But then press play again, because we have one more source. Our source today comes from an article called Britain's Child Slaves. They started at 4 a.m., lived off acorns, and had nails put through their ears for shoddy work. Yet, says a new book, their misery helped forge Britain. It's an article about a book called Childhood and Child Labor by uh, historian James Humphreys. As we go through this source, remember our big questions about industrialization, which if you've forgotten, you can pause here and read over them themselves. The tunnel was narrow and a mere 16 inches high in places. The workers could barely kneel in it, let alone stand. Thick, choking coal dust filled their lungs as they crawled through the darkness, their knees scraping on the rough surface and their muscles contracting with pain. A single hurrier pulled the heavy cart of coal, weighing as much as 500 pounds, attached by a chain to a belt worn around the waist, while one or more thrusters pushed from behind. Acrid water dripped from the tunnel ceiling, soaking their ragged clothes. Many would die from lung cancer and other diseases before they reached 25. Four, shockingly, these human beasts of burden were children, some only five years old. Robert North, who worked in a coal mine in Yorkshire, told an inspector, I went into the pit at seven years of age. When I drew by the girdle and chain, my skin was broken and the blood ran down. If we said anything, they would beat us. Another young hurrier, Patience Kershaw, had a bald patch on her head from years of pushing carts, often with her scalp pressed against them, for 11 miles a day underground. Sometimes they, the miners, beat me if I'm not quick enough, she said. Others, like Sarah Gooder, aged eight, were used as trappers. Crouching in the darkness of the tunnel walls, they waited to open trap doors which allowed the carts to travel through. I have to trap without a light, and I'm scared, she told the inspector. I go at four and sometimes half past three in the morning and come out at five and half past. Sometimes I sing when I've light, but not in the dark. I don't like being in the pit. Most were exhausted by their working hours. They were often woken at 4 a.m. and carried half asleep to the pits by their parents. Many young trappers were killed when they dozed off and fell into the paths of the carts. Ten-year-old Joseph Arkley forgot to shut a trap door, allowing po poisonous gas to seep into the tunnel. He died along with 10 others in the resulting explosion. But coal mining was just one industry in which children worked during the 18th and 19th centuries. The Industrial Revolution brought immense prosperity to the British Empire. Not only did Britannia rule the waves, she ruled the global marketplace too, dominating trade in cotton, wool, and other commodities, while her investors devised ingenious machinery to push productivity ever higher. But as a new book by Jane Humphreys, a professor of economic history shows, a terrible price was paid for the success by the laborers who serviced the machines, pushed the coal carts, and turned the wheels that drove the Industrial Revolution. Many of these laborers were children. With the mechanization of Britain, traditional cottage industries, which had employed many poor families, went out of business. Consequently, more and more poverty-stricken workers were driven into the major cities and factories. The competition for jobs meant that wages were low, and the only way a poor family could fend off starvation was for the children to work as well. These were the real David Copperfields and Oliver Twists. Beaten, exploited, and abused, they never knew what it was to have a full belly or a good night's sleep. Their childhood was over before it began. Using the heartbreaking first-person testimony of these child laborers, Humphreys demonstrates that the brutality and deprivation depicted by authors such as Charles Dickens and Thomas Hardy was commonplace during the Industrial Revolution and not just fictional exaggeration. She also reveals that more children were working than previously thought and at younger ages. As British productivity soared, more machines and factories were built and so more children were recruited to work in them. During the 1830s, the average age of a child laborer officially was 10, but in reality, somewhere as young as four. Many child scavengers lost limbs or hands, crushed in the machinery. Some were even decapitated. Those who were maimed lost their jobs. In one mill near Cork, there were six deaths and 60 mutilations in four years. While the upper class professed horror at the inequities of the slave trade, 
British children were regularly shackled and starved in their own country. The silks and cottons the upper classes wore, the glass jugs and steel knives on their tables, the coal in their fireplaces, the food on their plates. Almost all of it was produced by children working in pitiful conditions on their doorsteps. But to many of the moneyed classes, the rich, the poor were invisible, an inhuman subspecies who did not have the same feelings as their own and whose sufferings were unimportant. If they spared a thought for them at all, it was nothing more than a shudder of revulsion at the filth and disease they carried. Living conditions were appalling. Families occupied rat and sewage filled cellars with 30 people crammed into a single room. Most children were malnourished and susceptible to disease and life expectancy in such places fell to just 29 years in the 1830s. In these wretched circumstances, an extra few pennies brought home by a child would pay for a small loaf of bread or fuel for the fire, the difference between life and death. A third of poor households were without a male breadwinner, either as a result of death or desertion. In the broken Britain of the 19th century, children paid the price. One young boy, Thomas Sanderson, went out to work when his family was reduced to eating acorns they had foraged after his soldier father had been demobilized without a pension. In such deplorable conditions, with their parents grateful for the smallest contribution, most children were glad to help, however crippling the work. Children were the ideal laborers. They were cheap, paid just 10 to 20 cents of a man's wage. I'm sorry, 10 to 20% of a man's wage and could fit into small spaces such as under machinery and through narrow tunnels. But while parents sent their children to work with heavy hearts, the workhouses where orphaned and abandoned children were deposited had no such scruples. A child sent out to work was one mouth fewer to feed, so they were regularly told to mass or sold to masters as pauper apprentices. In exchange for board and lodging, they would work without wages until adulthood. If they ran away, they would be caught, whipped, and returned to their master. Some were shackled to prevent them from escaping, with irons riveted on their ankles and reaching by long links and rings up the hips, and in these they were compelled to walk to and fro from the mill to work and to sleep. It was also legal at this time to capture vagrant children and force them into apprenticeships, slavery in all but name. Children as young as five worked in gangs, digging turnips from for frozen soil or spreading manure. Many were so hungry that they resorted to eating rats. Orphaned Jonathan Seville was sold as a pauper apprentice to a master in a textile industry. His master threatened to knock out his brains if he did not get up to work and pushed him to the ground, breaking his thigh. Eventually, bent double and crippled, he was returned to the workhouse, no longer of any use to the brute. Robert Blinko, on whom Dickens's Oliver Twist is thought to be based, was sold, age six, as a climbing boy to a chimney sweep in London. Forced to scale the narrow chimneys, only 18 inches wide, he would scrape his elbows and knees on the brickwork and choke on the coal dust. It was common for the master sweep to light a fire under them to make them climb faster. Many climbing boys and girls fell to their deaths. After several months, Blinko was returned to the workhouse. Then, aged just seven, he was sent along with 80 other children to a cotton mill near Nottingham to work as a scavenger, crawling under the machines to pick up bits of cotton 14 hours a day, six days a week. In return, he was given porridge slops and black bread. Weak with hunger, at night he crept out to steal food from the mill's own, mill owner's pigs. Many child scavengers lost limbs or hands, crushed in the machinery. Some were even decapitated. Those who were maimed lost their jobs. In one mill near Cork, there were six deaths and 60 mutilations in four years. Blinko is lucky. He only lost half a finger. A German visitor to Manchester in 1842 remarked that there were so many limbless people, it was like living in the midst of an army just returned from campaign. A doctor who observed mill workers noted that their complexion is sallow and pallid with a peculiar flatness of feature caused by the want of a proper quantity of adipose substance, fatty tissue. Their stature low, a very general bowing of the legs. Nearly all have flat feet. 
the average height of the population fell in the 1830s as an overworked generation reached adulthood with knock knees, humped backs from carrying heavy loads, and damaged pelvises from standing 14 hours a day. Girls who worked in match factories suffered from a particularly horrible disease known as Fosse jaw. Do not Google it, super gross. Fumes from the phosphorus into which the matches were dipped ate at their jawbones, leaving them with empty cheeks that oozed foul-smelling liquid, brain damage, and eventually death from organ failure. Children in glassworks were regularly burned and blinded by intense heat, while the poisonous clay dust and potteries caused them to vomit and faint. Supervisors used terror and punishment to drive the children to greater productivity. A boy in a nail-making factory was punished for producing inferior nails by having his head down on an iron counter while someone hammered a nail through his ear. And the boy has made good nails ever since. But despite the growth of cities, agriculture remained the biggest employer of children during the Industrial Revolution. While they might have escaped the deadly fumes and machinery of the factories, the life of a child farm laborer was every bit as brutal. Children as young as five worked in gangs, digging turnips from frozen soil or spreading manure. Many were so hungry that they resorted to eating rats. Children in glassworks were regularly burned and blinded by the intense heat, while the poisonous clay dust and potteries caused them to vomit and faint. The gang master walked behind them with a double rope bound with wax, and woe betide any boy who made what was called a straight back, in other words, standing up straight, before he reached the end of the field. The rope would descend sharply upon him. Another favorite gang master's punishment was gibbeting, lifting a child off the ground by his neck until his face turned black. And yet, many of these children showed extraordinary resilience and lack of resentment. Children who worked six days a week spent the seventh Sunday at Sunday school, determined to better themselves. But whenever anyone sought to improve children's working conditions, they encountered fierce opposition from the proprietors or owners whose profits depended on exploiting them. They argued that any interference in the marketplace could cost Britain her manufacturing supremacy. Even when regulations were eventually passed to improve working conditions, with only four inspectors to police the thousands of factories across the country, they were seldom enforced. In 1840, Lord Ashley, later Lord Shaftesbury, set up the Children's Employment Commission, interviewing hundreds of children in coal mines, works, and factories. Its findings, reported in 1842, were deeply shocking. Many people had no idea that coal was excavated by young children, but it was the immorality rather than the cruelty of the mines that shocked them the most. As Inspector described how, the chain used to pull the carts, passing high up between the legs of two girls, had worn large holes in their trousers. Any sight more disgustingly indecent or revolting can scarcely be imagined. No brothel can beat it. An act was passed, prohibiting women and children under 10 from working underground. <clears throat> two years later, another act was passed, prohibiting the textile industry from employing children younger than nine. But it was not until the mid 19th century that children were limited to a 12 hour day. In 1880, the Compulsory Education Act helped reduce the numbers of child laborers and subsequent laws raised their age and made working conditions safer. But it had come too late for the little white slaves on whose blood, sweat, and toil our great railways, bridges, and buildings of the Industrial Revolution were built. So having learned about the costs and benefits of the industrialization, evaluate it. Do the benefits outweigh the costs? Pretend you're in charge of England in the 1880s. How would a growing working class cause potential political problems? What, if anything, would you do to solve those problems that industrialization created for the working class? And finally, pretend you're in the working class. What could you do to better your life? Pick one of these questions and answer it.